Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, you, you may not be aware, but there was the intention today to invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to you. However, uh, he <laughs> has been unable to attend, so you have now got me. I'm going to promise you three things. I'm not going to use the word independence, all right? I'm not going to use the word referendum, and I'm certainly not going to, well, maybe I will refer to Mr. Gove at some point during the course of my presentation. Today is really about trying to see the bigger picture in terms of professional learning and leading professional learning within the Scottish system and, as Andrina said, a very interesting array of speakers and workshops to support that in the course of today. We know where Scottish education is. Let's just think about setting it in the context of what we know. We know that it is a good system. When you look at all of the international comparisons, we come out reasonably well with considerable headroom for improvement in some areas. So part of the challenge for Scottish education just now is how we move that system on from being a good system which performs reasonably well in the international comparison tables, that delivers reasonably well for most youngsters in the system, and a system that has got far greater variation, worryingly so, within institutions than across the institutions. And there's a challenge there for all of you as leaders and myself and colleagues from GTCS and other national bodies and how we, how we make up that difference in the variation that exists within institutions, which is far greater, as I say, than across the institutions in Scotland. You know that uh, GTCS issues five magazines a year. I'm sure you all uh, sleep with them under your pillow at evening. Uh, the most recent one in the keynote I made the point that I felt that within the Scottish education system just now, and looking ahead 10 years or so, we will look back at this time as really being a time of very significant shift, very significant change in basically how we do education in 21st century Scotland. We know that there are major issues that confront the Scottish education system and Scottish society at large. We know that there is huge inequality in Scottish society which is reflected in the challenges that you as educational leaders face day, out, day in, day out in your schools and other institutions. We know that problem solving abilities can vary from between 6 and 13 months between those most advantaged and most disadvantaged areas in our society. And even more worryingly, language skills varying by as much as up to 18 months of a difference. And that presents very real challenges to all of us that are in the education system. And part of the way that we need to look at moving forward is how do we deal with the kind of curriculum that we offer, not cohorts or classes, but individual youngsters, in order that they can genuinely maximise their potential. Way back in 2007, given the theme of today's conference, the, the report on Scottish education by OECD made the point that what we need in order to do away with the inequalities in society, the, what they would call institutional rigidities of the past, and keep that phrase in mind when we think about where we're trying to move with Curriculum for Excellence, institutional rigidities, inequalities, what is needed is clear-sighted, vigorous leadership from yourselves as individual teachers and practitioners, as leaders within schools, colleges and other educational institutions. And this was something that was well noted way back in 2006, and I had great pleasure in sitting beside my former colleague Chris McElroy, who was absolutely instrumental in writing this report way back in 2006, the first of the then HMIE's Improving Scottish Education Reports. And look what it was identifying, the need for future education systems, if they are to be <coughs> successful, requiring responsive, flexible, uh, uh, responsiveness and flexibility and openness to new ideas. And we've come a long way in that last seven eight or, or eight years. And a lot of it's predicated, I think, on some of the kinds of uh, statements that way back in the past, the American futurist Alvin Toffler was making. And I use this quite a lot in my presentation because I think it really sets the kind of rationale for not just where we want to be as an education system, but fundamentally 
for curriculum for excellence itself. I know that term might disappear, and Mike Russell, if he was here, might even say that himself. What we're talking about is a pedagogy, uh, a way of developing an education system that is fit for the future, not just for the next two or three years, not just for the next five years, but for the next generation in Scottish society. And Toffler's quote about future learners isn't those who can't read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And if you apply that at a system level and at a school level, I would suggest that you can take exactly the same notion and place it within a, an institutional context. Those schools that are not going to be successful in future for its youngsters are those that cannot continuously innovate, change and improve. And all of that requires strong leadership, clear leadership, dedicated leadership. So we've got curriculum for excellence. Never, never I think, at any time in Scottish education has there been a degree of consensus around the principles of curriculum for excellence from all quarters. It doesn't matter which political uh, persuasion you, you listen to. Everybody is wholly signed up to those principles because they're designed to try and improve outcomes for all learners, close the gap, improve standards. Folk have said to me in the past in my previous existence in Education Scotland as Chief Inspector, you know, what's Curriculum for Excellence about? I use this slide very often with parents. Say, down that right hand side you've got three or four big key messages of what it is Curriculum for Excellence as part of an educational change process is genuinely about. It's about trying to close that gap that I referred to earlier. It is about trying to improve standards in spite of what you might read in some of the uh, ill-informed press and media from time to time. It is genuinely about trying to create a system that will be a sustainable, high-performing system for the longer term. That's not easy. This is the first time ever in Scottish education we have tried to transform the whole of the 3 to 18 agenda, and arguably beyond, in a winner. If you think about what we've done in the past, we've taken bite-sized chunks, we've taken standard grade, and we've worked something uh, in standard grade and everything else jiggled around to try and fit into it. We've taken higher still. We've taken 5 to 14. This, no wonder it's so difficult. This is the first time we have adopted this total transformation of the entire formal education system. And it's no surprise that folk come to it quicker than others. I think we are going through, as I used in the much maligned audit report that I wrote a couple of years ago, we're going through a process of evolutionary change, progressive evolution. And there are some folk who are off the blocks very quickly, and I've certainly seen that in the past when I've been visiting schools where you see Curriculum for Excellence and all its principles well embedded within the system, and others who are much further behind. But the direction of travel is very much what it's about, and what it also requires and again, this is why I think it is taking so long to get into the system and get into the way of thinking. It's fundamentally about cultural change. We have been fed a diet in Scottish education for the last 30 years of top-down direction. Chris will know, and other colleagues who have been involved as associate assessors will know, that one of the easiest quality indicators ever to evaluate was the curriculum QI. Because if you weren't doing 80 hours in every mode, then it automatically became an action point at the end of the report. It was very much top down. What we're trying to do in Scottish education and what we've been trying to do for the last <coughs> five or six years in cranking up Curriculum for Excellence is to give much more responsibility, and you've heard the term, much more autonomy to the delivery end, to the practitioners who know the youngsters best, who know the kind of curriculum and the kind of experiences that they themselves are going to most benefit from. But it's not just curriculum for excellence. And I think I've used this slide in quite a few presentations to make the point that there are a hell of a lot of things happening out there in the system just now. It's one of the reasons why Certainly those of you who are practising teachers will think from day to day that things are just getting stacked upon you. But the point I want to make is that there is very close alignment between the myriad of things that are happening out there. It doesn't matter whether it's Curriculum for Excellence or whether it's GERFEC or whether it's what Education Scotland has done with the inspection model in the last three or four years to try and improve the quality of professional dialogue during inspection. 
whether it's what Petra Wend will talk about uh, later on today, the National Implementation Board's work in moving forward teaching Scotland's future. And it's, it's particularly helpful that Graham Donaldson, the author, is doing one of the seminars later on himself. The fact that we recognise for the first time ever that we need a Scottish College for Educational Leadership, which my predecessor, Tony Finn, is heading up on an interim basis at the moment. The new national qualifications, let's, let's be honest, we've gone through this four or five times in my educational experience, from standard grade, from higher still, from uh, the introduction of intermediates, we're going through exactly the same process with nationals four and five, and we'll go through the same with higher as we embed new qualifications. And there lies one of the problems in the education system. And I'll touch on this later on. We've been so thrilled to driving youngsters to attainment, narrow attainment in examinations. In some ways, we've actually forgotten what the job is about. It's about preparing youngsters for that lifelong learning, giving them the range of experiences that allow them to maximise their success as they go through life and not just solely to pass examinations. One of the seminars today is on the Senior Phase Benchmarking Tool, a new acronym for you. Right? A recognition that the, the stacks, tables that secondary schools have used, the tables of uh, uh, attainment, have been very, very narrow, and we need to look at recognising much wider achievement and how we get a handle on how we can make that better for youngsters. It's going to be a wonderful tool, and Eileen Gill from Scottish Government will be here to talk about it in one of the seminars later. And then from the GTCS end, what's been happening in the last year and what continues to happen, and Zoe and Rosa, my two colleagues from GTCS, are running one of the seminars later on, heavily involved in rewriting the standards, the three sets of standards that are now in the system. Professional update and professional learning generally, promoting that as a means by which the profession itself can deal with delivering high quality learning and teaching for the next generation. I think this aligns around th four main themes, four main aspects or four main features that we're trying to create within the education system. Firstly, a much greater customer focus, a much more user-centric focus in giving teachers the authority and giving them the autonomy and giving them the leadership to devise programmes and courses that best fit the needs of individual youngsters within their charge. Supporting achievement by all, recognising for the first time in a while, I think, in some cases, that whilst examination attainment is important, that wider achievement and what a youngster can genuinely achieve in the widest sense through their skills, their dispositions, their attitudes and such like, is much more beneficial for them as lifelong learners going ahead than perhaps has been the case in the past. Trying to create a performance framework that, that allows continuous performance, uh, continuous change and review and improvement. And all of the things that I showed you on that jigsaw are designed to provide part of that infrastructure that takes the education system forward, closely aligned one to another. And then this whole model of reconceptualising teacher professionalism, part of what GTCS has been doing in the context of professional update, the changes that we have made to the conduct and competence procedures within GTCS, where the focus is much less on disciplining and much more on fitness to teach, the importance of teaching in the system. This diagram, I think, goes back to what I hinted at earlier. We've been bedeviled in Scottish education for a generation of teaching to qualifications by looking at curriculum change and thinking about pedagogical change only at a time when the qualifications change. We've seen it with standard grade, we saw it with higher still, we've seen it with 5 to 14. And really it has been the assessment, the qualifications cog that's cranked the pedagogical wheel. Where we're trying to move to and where I think the system needs to be in Scottish education is a much greater focus on what we know are the two things that make the biggest difference. Leadership and the quality of learning and teaching. The learner-teacher interaction. And that then driving what we then need to assess and what we then award by way of qualifications and certification. That's a big ask of a system that's been brought up for the last generation 
with the previous notion and a top-down directive approach to curriculum and to some extent as a result of learning and teaching. Coming back to uh, teaching, uh, Teachers Matter from OECD, the most significant res resource in schools we know are teachers. They are central to improving uh, uh, schools and the efforts they make to give youngsters the best deal possible. And what we need therefore are competent people who need to work as teachers. And if you think about the transformation that there's been in teacher education, certainly in the last five to 10 years, in terms of the standards that are required for getting into teacher education and the processes that they go through with the teacher induction programme held high worldwide as being one of the most effective ways of bringing <coughs> teachers into the early phase of their education career. And I've said this to one or two folk I know in the audience before, but if you've never actually read John Hattie's book, Visible Learning, it's well worth a read. I've picked out two pieces from this book, which I think uh, really give an indication of, a, 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 of the direction of travel that we're trying to move within creating this structure in Scotland, this infrastructure for continuous improvement. The first ones I particularly like the major source of student variance, and don't we just know it, the major source of student variance is the individual teacher. I saw it starkly in an inspection a few years ago where a, a supply teacher or a cover class was being uh, taken by a teacher who had the kids in the ceiling for the first 25 minutes. There was no effective learning taking place. And I went back to see that class at the end of the same period, on the same day, in the same school, same weather, all the circumstances were the same. And a probationer teacher was in taking the class with very impressive engagement with the youngsters. What was the difference? The difference was the individual teacher. And when John Hattie's research, which is amongst the, the most widespread of any in the world on what constitutes effective change and improvement in education systems, the remarkable feature that the biggest effect on student learner learning is when teachers become learners of their own teaching. And that's very much one of the themes and one of the directions of travel that the education system in Scotland has begun to move and needs to move further in order that it gives youngsters the best deal possible over the longer term. And again, recognising that some of the things that are happening in other parts of the world dare I say, south of the border. I promised I wouldn't m mention that gentleman, but uh, we know that these top-down, non-consultative impositions on the teaching profession are not going to be sustainable because there is no buy-in. What we've tried to do over the last five years in Scotland with the development of Curriculum for Excellence, the development of the revised standards, the development of professional update is to bring the system with us. And you should feel part of that. You should feel proud of being part of that. You should also recognise the role that you play and the, the role that acts and whatever you become thereafter can, will continue to play in order to drive the education system forward. Sustainable development by teachers and with teachers as opposed to top-down imposition on them. And just another couple of quotes, which again, some of you will recognise from some of the McKinsey research, the quality of an education system cannot outperform the quality of its teachers. And then this notion that whilst we want professionals to be engaged, they need to have an infrastructure around about them to be supported, to be led within a, a solid, well understood infrastructure of support that allows for the changing of professional practice. And I go back to that, I think that is the infrastructure. Now you could add other things to that. I mentioned GERFECT, you could throw in the Shinari indicators and so on. To me, they all align in trying to move the education system forward as an improving, continuously changing, reflective uh, education system that continues over the longer term to deliver for its youngsters. Think again about where the likes of Education Scotland are just now with the 3 to 18 curriculum learning, teaching and assessment bodies that they're, the groups that they're just about to establish uh, are in the process of establishing. That is to get away from what again has bedeviled us where 
The decision is taken to change a particular aspect or a particular sector of the curriculum and then everything else has to move into place in order to try and align with it. Is it not better that we drive the qualifications change by looking first and foremost at what is appropriate within the curriculum and within the learning and teaching? And the 3 to 18 curriculum learning and teaching and assessment groups that are being led by Education Scotland are designed to do just that, keep the curriculum under constant review in order that changes then can be made through the curriculum and learning and teaching to what we then deem to be important for qualifications and for assessment. And I know that it's still early days, but uh, as I understand it, these curriculum learning and teaching and assessment groups are already being uh, formed. And Graham's report itself, with lots of useful information, useful quotes to pull out, I've just taken out one. You know, the system requires professionals to undertake professional learning, who take responsibility for their own development, who develop their capacity to both use and contribute to their own development, but crucially to the collective understanding. And some of the very best practice is when professionals engage directly with each other on what has happened, what has worked well, what hasn't worked well. One of the biggest changes we made to the inspection process, and it was Graham and Chris and others who led it, was to create much more space within inspection for professional dialogue. Those of you who have been uh, subject to an inspection over the last three or four years, I hope you would agree, would feel that there was much greater space for inspectors to engage directly with teachers and at the same time to be a catalyst for discussion principally about learning and teaching and what works well and what needs to work better uh, within the individual schools that have been inspected. And the role of folk like yourselves and organisations like ACTS very much understanding the complexities of education. Teaching we know is not an easy job and it's not just about education in itself, it's all the other services that impact on the readiness of a family or a, a youngster to learn in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an educational context. Understanding the complexities, but being key actors in shaping and leading educational change. And that again is the kind of vision and the direction of travel that the education system in Scotland is trying to move towards. In Education Scotland and in GTCS, we get lots of visitors from overseas. As Zoe and Rosa know, just the other week there, we had a group of 19 folk from various European countries. Last week it was, I think it was Croatia, Rosa, wasn't it? It's quite remarkable, the number of folk who come over to Scotland and see what we are trying to do in, with this infrastructure that we have created, with all those constituent parts of the jigsaw, who, who quite openly, and these are, Highly able uh, professionals uh, from uh, colleges, from schools, from departments of education, from ministries and so on, who really know their onions and who say to us when they go, and it's not just being nice to us, the Scottish education system is much further down the road in trying to create a mechanism for continuous change and improvement that will set it up well for the future than many other countries in the world. That's not to say that it's an easy task and it's, we know already just how difficult it is trying to meld all of this together. But taking the opportunity in a day like today to stand back and see that wider picture and see what that infrastructure is trying to do and place yourselves as leaders of education in the role that needs to take that forward. There's a report which we're actually going to discuss within GTC uh, next week, the uh, uh, BERA RSA report. Inquiry Orientated Leadership, British Educational Research Association. Inquiry Orientated Leadership, crucial to create conditions for inquiry oriented teaching associated with the greatest gains that pupils can have in terms of their learning and educational outcomes. And of course, GTC has a role in that, and you wouldn't expect me to stand here as Chief Executive and not give a bit of a plug to GTCS. Very briefly, the new standards the new set of standards, standard for, standards for registration, pretty well known to all of you. Standards for career-long professional learning, large aspects of which you will recognise as, as charter teachers, derived from standard for charter teacher. Encouraging the profession to be more inquiring, more research-based, and looking at in depth at the kind of learning and teaching 
that actually works. And for those who have aspirations to middle and senior leadership and management in the education system and beyond, a benchmark standard for leadership and management against which you can uh, look at your own practice and look at how you might plan and plot your, your career change as you move through the education system. There's a lot on the website about professional standards. I'm not going to go into them in any detail. I mentioned simply the code of professionalism and conduct, not because it's something that you necessarily need to sleep with under your pillow, but we have had an increase, just interestingly, in the last month or so from teachers inquiring about uh, the R word and what will happen in September. And how am I as a teacher, not just a modern studies teacher, very often from primary teachers who are wanting to take advantage of the, the scenario in the 18th of September, and I've avoided the word again, uh, you know, where am I placed? What do I need to do in this context? What guidance do I have in how I deal with these difficult political sensitive issues? So I simply mention that in passing for you. And again, encouraging with the direction of travel this high quality professional learning, sustained professional learning for teachers themselves, inspiring youngsters as a result of them becoming directly involved in high quality professional <coughs> learning individually, or as I was suggesting earlier, collegiately. And it doesn't need to be attending a course on a Saturday, and I take my hat off to you for doing so. There are a whole range of ways in which you can develop your professional learning. When it comes to professional update, which I'll briefly touch on, these are the kinds of experiences that in your portfolio you should reference as we know delivering some of the best CPD that is available to you. It doesn't need to be a course. Professional dialogue with colleagues, uh, leading a practitioner inquiry or doing a piece of action research, doing some professional reading, peer support, coaching and mentoring, all of these sorts of things are contexts within which high quality professional learning can take place. And professional update, as you'll recognise from the, the most recent version of the, the Teaching Scotland magazine, professional update itself affecting everyone who is on the register of GTCS, all 75,000 uh, from August this year with a number of key principles which again align to the direction of travel and moving forward, creating a self-sustaining, improving education system for the next generation. One of those foundations, professional update, where teachers have got a responsibility to consider their own development needs. We know how much the education system in society has changed in the last five or 10 years. We know it's going to change even more in the next five to 10 years. Pretty much everyone in this room, I'm sure, will hope to be in part of that education system. So it is incumbent on us to update our professional knowledge, our skills, our competencies as part of that entire direction of travel and professional update in part of that infrastructure that will lead to that sustained improvement. It brings with it an entitlement to professional review and development and it builds very much on the, the existing PRD schemes that operate across authorities and elsewhere because about 20,000 of the 75,000 that are on the register in fact are not practicing teachers. They're folk like you know Rosa and Zoe who work in GTCS, they're like HMI, they're folk in universities, they're quality improvement officers and such like. The system itself building its professional skills in support of teachers, in support of learners. It requires first and foremost, and this is the only kind of plug that I will make for GTC today, it does require you to go in and make sure that your details are up to date and I would encourage you to do that by going into my GTCS and if you haven't got an account it's dead easy to open one. You are required legally to provide GTCS with any changes to your, your, uh, your personal details so that's the starting point. To continue to engage in professional learning, to use the likes of the GTC standards at whatever stage in order to evaluate where you are and where your career might wish to progress. Using your PRD process to help support and maintain a, a record of professional learning. And I've given you some examples of what that might comprise. And then every fifth year, have you, having your professional update signed off by your line manager. It is no more bureaucratic than the current PRD system that you have. And in fact, part of the validation exercise that GTCS is carrying out to ensure that PRD schemes are to a particular standard 
is to try and make sure that uh, there is no additional requirement or workload requested of you through professional update. And the really interesting bit, well, when is it going to kick in? Well, it's going to kick in for everybody from August 14. But it will take a five-year phasing period in order that professional update will have touched everyone uh, by way of having it signed off. And it will de be dependent on your registration year. So if, for example, you registered in 1999 or 2004, then at the end of 1415, your professional update will be signed off. And all that GTCS needs to know is that that is the case. It will have been signed off. The responsibility will be through the normal PRD schemes that you operate. And there's much more information on the website on professional update. And I simply just encourage you all as charter teachers and to encourage colleagues to look at ways in which that professionalism might be recognised. As you know, many of you, I'm sure, GTCS have professional recognition awards for pieces of research that have been done, some excellent research that's happened. Uh, that's recognised in a myriad of ways, but certainly one of the ways that we are keen to uh, play our part in the system is to offer professional recognition awards to an even greater extent than we currently do. If we are going to have this inquiry oriented leadership, what's it going to produce, let's say, in another five or ten years' time? Thinking about the alignment, thinking about the bits of the jigsaw, thinking about the infrastructure that we're trying to create within the education system in Scotland. These are the sorts of things that by 2020, I would hope that infrastructure, that alignment will begin to produce. A profession with a much greater emphasis across the board on learning and teaching and the process of learning and teaching and an understanding of the processes of learning and teaching and engagement and discussion about learning and teaching. In a learning profession, uh, new approaches to leadership in place, scale being only part of that, and Petra will say more about that uh, shortly. And critically, a much more flexible profession, one where professionals recognise the need for ongoing change and development. We're never going to be in the position as we've been in the past when we make changes to qualifications and we all heave a sigh of relief and we think, well, that's it for another seven years, you know, whew, we can get over it. I think the normality in future will be that ongoing review and should be that ongoing review and needs to be that ongoing review and development in order that the education system in the future can continue to deliver for the needs of youngsters now and for the next generation. So I hope that sets in context some of what you're going to pick up today. Thank you very much indeed again for the invitation. <laughs>